Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical. Welcome back and on today's episode I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. It's just going to be me and I'm going to give you my open and honest opinion of an exhibition that hit the press worldwide when it opened in London earlier in 2021 and has had hundreds of thousands of fans flock to the capital to get to see it. And that is the v as blockbuster exhibition, Alice, Curiouser and Curiouser. Now for those of you who live in London like myself, or perhaps further afield in the UK, it kind of seems to be you really couldn't go anywhere without tripping up over an advert for the v latest exhibition. And it was pegged as the blockbuster exhibition of 21 and a complete celebration and reimagining of the Lewis Carroll's classic tale, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So I'll be very honest and say I've never actually read Alice in Wonderland. And I think that's because I've seen it as the Disney movie and when I was very little I actually found the movie quite scary because, you know, it's a young girl, she goes off on her own, she's in this strange land where she keeps, you know, changing sizes, meeting all these quite intimidating, scary characters and it, I, perhaps it was just far beyond my years when I watched the Disney movie. But it's never really captured my imagination or I've never really overthought the story, shall we say. So although I've never read it and it was potentially not my, might even be my least favourite Disney movie, it really does, it really does scare me when I was little. I I love the V&A, the V&A, which is the Victoria and Albert Museum, for those of you listening that are not in the UK. The Victoria and Albert Museum in London is my favourite museum in London. And They've really never put a foot wrong in terms of the blockbuster exhibitions that I've gone to see. So I've thought, right, okay, I'll I'll go with an open mind and let's see what happens. So I'm going to give you an honest and open opinion of my walkthrough of the exhibition and talk about a few of the key standout moments within the exhibition. I hope you enjoy. So for those of you who may not have heard of the v the v stands for the Victoria and Albert Museum and it's a museum, as I've said previously, in London and it's the world's largest museum of applied arts, decorative arts and design and houses a permanent collection of roughly 2.2 million objects. It's big. Trust me, it's big. And it was actually founded in 1852 and it's named after Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Now, it wasn't originally called... The v It was called the Kensington Museum and the funds for the, the Kensington Museum, now known as the v came from an exhibition that took place called the Great Exhibition in 1851 that was put on by Prince Albert and a gentleman called Henry Cole. And the point of the exhibition was to show Britain as this industrial powerhouse and decorative powerhouse. And it happened in this amazing place called the Crystal Palace, and so many people came to this exhibition. It was unbelievable. It was believed something like one in every three British citizens or one in every five British citizens came to London to visit the Great Exhibition in 1851, and it was a humongous success. It made so much money that they decided to use the profits from the 1851 Great Exhibition and founded the South Kensington Museum, what we now know as the v I might actually, I really love the the Great Exhibition of 1851 and the story behind it and all the the funding that it, the profits still fund today. They still have research funds that come out of the money that was generated back then. And it's just, it's a really interesting story. So I might actually do uh, a podcast episode on the history of the V&A. So do let me know if you'd be interested in that. But anyway, over to Alice. So the V&A, in my opinion, has never put on a bad exhibition and even the exhibitions that I don't really fancy going to see so for example in 2019 they had an exhibition on about the history of cars and I am not in any way a petrol head really couldn't be bothered about cars but this exhibition was fantastic I learned so much it was really interesting and I think it's really started me down a rabbit hole actually no pun intended of teaching me so many different things about lots of various subjects. They had an exhibition on a couple, I think 2018, they had a um, 
a video game exhibition, which was just phenomenal, and I'm not a gamer. And more importantly, they introduced me to the wonderful Tim Walker, who, who is a photographer. And I'm going to talk about him a little bit later because he does make an appearance in the Alice Curiouser and Curiouser exhibition. So my top tip for anybody that's going to visit these large blockbuster shows, I would say go on a Sunday and go first thing in the morning. And I, and I, and I know... I know it is disgusting getting up early on a Sunday morning, who are we all kidding? But I was there for 10 to 10, the museum opens at 10, and there was already a queue to get in. This is how popular this exhibition is. So waited, museum opened, we were ushered in rather quickly, thank goodness it was quite a sunny morning. And the exhibition is in an extension of the v and which opened, I think, I think about 10 years ago, it's called the Salisbury Wing, I might be wrong there. But anyway went down to the exhibition so you did kind of feel like you were going down the rabbit hole so I think they set the scene rather beautifully and they had all these play these humongous playing cards above head as you sort of went down the stairs and when you went through to the first room it was all these it was about the author and the girl called Alice which had inspired the novel and to be honest with you I'm not I wasn't too interested in the history there was some there were some curious things such as teapots and time pieces such as clocks and pocket watches and some sketches and things like that but it, nothing that was really sort of setting my soul on fire and I decided I just had a quick look round. I just had a quick look round and then moved on. The second room again was sort of setting the scene it was all these all these huge pages that were hung over you in banners just kind of talked about the history of the book and its successes how it was published how many copies has been sold worldwide so once you had moved through the sort of introduction stages of the exhibition it moved through into cinema and television adaptations now the book since it was published over 150 years ago has continuously been reimagined and revisited for film and television and what the v and did quite quite cleverly i thought was having quite a lot of different screens that showed you a lot of the original adaptation. So, for example, in 1903, it was a British silent film and then it was revisited again in 1910 and was redirected and reshot. And then in 1915, it was visited once again. And then in 1931, the first talking adaptation was directed and released. And it's been revisited constantly and constantly. So I'm looking here at Wikipedia, the Gospel According To, and if I say there's about 30 adaptations or times it's been revisited by film and television. It's, it's quite incredible. And they just sort of looked at the development of Alice as a character, how it's been used in film and television. But then, and later, they sort of, move out of the genre of, of movies but a lot of it was I was I was kind of underwhelmed at this point if I'm perfectly honest with you so there was a lot of screens I thought it was great to see the development of costume design how cinema filming has come on that was all very interesting but a bit underwhelming and a bit sparse the next couple of rooms I found were very sparse in comparison to other V&A shows that I've been to and I don't know if it was because the first room was so jam-packed with things that the next few rooms felt a little bit bare. If I have, it would kind of be my only sort of, well, one of my criticisms to the exhibition. And then it had like original movie posters, which again are nice to see. But there was a point I was kind of like, mm, I just kind of feel like they were scrambling around to fill wall space, which is terrible. And I'm, I'm a diehard v &A fan, but it left me very underwhelmed. And then we moved into a room that had this weird caterpillar, which obviously the caterpillar is a huge, a huge, huge part of the novel, where Alice meets the caterpillar and he, and he asks the question, who are you? And it was questions around your identity, what you, who and how you identify with yourself. But the caterpillar just seemed to be this really strange fiberglass sculpture which had decking chairs underneath it it was really odd and, and I'll see if I can find an image online it's 
thoroughly underwhelming. And I don't know if that's because they made those rooms underwhelming because what was to come next was very sort of full force and and again sort of revisiting the idea of what Alice was. So the first part of the exhibition, if I'm perfectly honest, I found a little bit underwhelming. But then you moved through and at the halfway point we got to a stage where it was called Reimagining Alice. And this was where the exhibition came into its own and I was like, okay, they've done it, they're back in the room. And they had a mix of, I don't know, the next couple of rooms just explored how the subject has been revisited from sort of the 1930s onwards. So they had the work of Max Ernst, who is an incredibly well-known surrealist sculptor. And this drew the link between the surrealists and Carl's novel and how they live in a imaginary world and and Alice is in this very dreamlike state because of you remember at the end of Alice she's in her ventures in Wonderland she she wakes up and it's all been a dream and she's dreamed all these characters and they drew a really lovely link between the surrealists and Alice and they had a couple of quotes from Max Ernst and some of his surrealist contemporaries about how Alice had was was essentially the first surrealist, which I found very, very interesting in and in a sort of juxtaposition that I'd never really, or comparison that I had never really drawn between the two. And then it sort of moved through and spoke about the 1960s and 1970s and how Alice became this poster child for hallucinogenic drugs and how, again, she was the poster girl for essentially having a trip on, on drugs which again was so interesting because I'd never really thought of... What I love about the v is that they can take a theme and really, really stretch it and sort of spark all these different questions, which of course is the point of any good curator and any exhibition. It's to spark engagement, it's to readdress what we know and start different conversations. That's the whole point of an exhibition. So it really, really got me thinking. And I really enjoyed it and it showed you that Disney had relaunched Alice in that time as well and they had used all these very psychedelic um, patterned movie posters that starred the Cheshire Cat and yeah it was it it was a really interesting curveball and then they had works by a British artist called Peter Blake who sort of teeters on the edge of of pop art at the sort of Brits at 60s, 70s. Then they had this amazing video installation within the gallery space that you just, it was it was a tea party table, so it was supposed to be you'd arrived at the Mad Hatter's tea party, but there was just tables and chairs and then there was a pattern, there was a light show projected onto the table and throughout the light show it would change to patterns to then being being a set table for a tea party and then it would have mice um, running over it and the mice would sort of jump between all the plates and and as the mice hit the plates it would clink and it, it looked really real it was it was quite something to behold but I think one of my standout things happened in the room that followed this which was a virtual reality game which they had commissioned especially for the exhibition so this is one of three things that I think really really stood out for me and again it was the reimagining Alice, this part of the exhibition. So I'm going to play you just a little introduction to the VR experience. At the beginning of our journey with HTC and Preloaded, we really wanted to identify what was going to be unique about this experience, what could VR deliver that really helps bring Wonderland to life. Whether it's like falling down a rabbit hole or stepping through the looking glass, VR is the absolute perfect new media to explore where we can take Alice next. VR is so good at being able to express those types of changes of state and changes of perception, changes of scale. And these are things that you can feel in the VR and it can be experienced in this project we've made. So I'm going to stop it there purely for copyright reasons. Um, I absolutely loved this. So what you had to do is you walked into a room and it was kind of like you had shrunk and you were in very, very high grass and you had to sit on a toadstool top and you're handed a VR headset and you put the headset on. And I've later learned that there's like three or four different 
versions that you can take. But the one I was given, so I took the headset and I put it on and you are in the countryside and you're told, pick up this bottle and drink it and you and you drink the bottle and then you fall down the rabbit hole and you physically feel that you're falling, it's unbelievable. And you, again, once you get down the rabbit hole, you drink something else and then you shrink once again and then you go through this door and you're in the Queen's Rose Garden and then you play croquet with the, the Queen of Hearts. And I was absolutely rubbish at this game. So essentially you had to pick up little hedgehogs that sort of rolled up into your back. They were really, really cute. I really loved it. And it just, it felt so real. It was unbelievable. You could pick up these hedgehogs and you had to play croquet just like she does in the book. And for me, I'm not a gamer. I am. I actually, VR things make me feel quite sick and I can't actually go and see 3D movies being made or 3D movies in the cinema because I feel really, really sick. But I absolutely love this and I just thought, my gosh, what a really clever way to reimagine a story, revisit a story and make it relevant for today's audience and kids that are coming into these spaces today. I seriously cannot applaud the v enough for this. I think they do a brilliant job at that and trying to stay ahead of the curve, considering this is probably this, this exhibition has probably been in the works for about four or five years. Take my hat off to them. This edition of a virtual reality game with Alice, with Alice and the Queen was fantastic. So that is one of my three, one of my top three. When you finish the VR experience, and it was all very safe, actually, I must say, with COVID, you were, you were given a little, so you know, in COVID, for COVID, you have, you have to cover your face with a mask. Well, they also gave you an eye mask for the VR set um, that had eye holes. So I, th I thought that was quite a clever way of still being able to have an interactive thing in the time of COVID. So, yeah, just throwing that in there. And then the next part of the exhibition was exploring how Alice... And Wonderland has inspired generations and generations of fashion designers. And this I loved. So they had the, the first room was, was a series that the Royal Opera House put on in 2015, or show rather, in 2015 that the Royal Opera House in London put on. And it was, of course, Alice in Wonderland. And the costumes were incredible, but it made everything look so high-end fashion, almost couture. And even the Mad Hatters, it was just so, the silks were beautiful. Alice's dress was, oh my gosh, so spiky and very, almost kind of like wearing hot pants almost, but it was just beautiful. And the Red Queen was just out of this world. So she was in this humongous, what I'm assuming must be microfiber heart. And you could just see that sort of clipped in her, her hips. So you had the bodice, the headdress. And at the base of the bodice, this heart clipped in, but the heart opened and then the dancer would be released. And that's how the queen would dance and enter the enter each of her scenes. I'll, I'll put some images up on my Instagram page. I honestly thought it was phenomenal. A really, really clever way to do it. However, the next room looked at fashion designers like Alexander McQueen, Vivian Westwood, and more importantly, which I think this is my top, top thing from the exhibition, was a series of photographs taken by the amazing, amazing Tim Walker. Now, Tim Walker, if you don't know who he is, he is a British fashion photographer. And he's known for reimagining and creating these beautiful, complex stories. And all his characters are, in his, in his, um, in his photographs, his characters are very otherworldly almost and then what they were on what they were showing on display was Tim Walker's 2018 revisiting of Alice in Wonderland for a Pirelli calendar now I had absolutely no idea what Pirelli was it is uh, ready for this an Italian tire brand I'm going to repeat that an, an Italian tire brand that every year since the 60s has released a very high-end fashion catalogue. Now it was mostly sort of poster girls and then in 2010 it took a bit of a turn and they now have sort of leading actresses and models pose for the calendar 
and Thames, from what I can see, was really the only themed calendar so far. They have themes like actresses with no makeup on and things like that, and they're all beautifully shot. But this one was Alice in Wonderland, but with an entirely black cast. And they're just the most powerful images. So I'm going to just read you this statement from Vogue in 2018. So it says, Tim Walker is known for his surreal imagery and the 2018 Pirelli calendar shot by the British photographer delivers on all counts. Starring an all-black cast, including Sean Combs, Ruthie Goldberg, Naomi Campbell, RuPaul, Dickie Thought, Zoe Bordeaux, Slick Woods and P. Diddy and more, the 2018 calendar is a fantastical retelling of Alice in Wonderland for the modern age. And quoting Tim Walker, I wanted to go back to the genius of the imagination behind Lewis Carroll so that you could tell it from the very beginning again. I wanted to find a different and original angle. And there's a beautiful model called Dickie Thought who stars as Alice in Walker's retelling. And th these images are so incredibly powerful. They're, they're so beautiful. So the calendar was shot in 2018 and was released and it was conceptualised with the help of British Vogue editor-in-chief Edmund Einenfull, who said, and I quote here, to see a black Alice today means children of all races can embrace the idea of diversity from a young age and also acknowledge that beauty comes in all colours, which is so incredibly beautiful. Another interview that I was reading in GQ about the series where Tim Walker was essentially saying, used to be told by people that hired me that you can't hire black models and he said it's just it's just not what it's about. Like everybody should be able to see themselves in, in literature and the culture that surrounds them. So I completely applaud them for it because I think it's phenomenal. And then very interestingly, Tim apparently got the idea of turning everything upside down because he had a conversation with Rodal's widow, so Rodal, the famous children's author. She had, a, she had a conversation with Rodal's widow, Felicity Dow, and she told him that Rodal's Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, that Charlie was actually supposed to be black. And he just thought, oh, I wonder how different the story would have been had it been black. So this is where the idea came from. And I must say, these images are amazing. They are so powerful so beautifully shot. RuPaul is the Red Queen. P. Diddy and Naomi Campbell are the executioners. Dickie Thought, as I've said, is Alice. And Whoopi Goldberg, I think she's the Prince of the Princess of Roses. They're just amazing. They're just amazing. I can't find the name of the, the actress who plays the Mad Hatter, but I'm going to put a selection of these images on my Instagram highlight show for this for this episode because they are just phenomenal. They are so incredible and they're so powerful. And I think that's what Tim Walker does so does best. He creates really powerful, like stop you in your tracks images. And I wonder if they do these in like editions or something because I would really love to own some of them. Maybe I'll just print some out and stick them on my wall. They are amazing. They are just amazing. And Naomi Campbell's also quoted in the GQ article that I was reading. And I'll link, I'll link all these in the show notes below. She says, with the new Vogue at the beginning of the week and Pirelli at the end of the week, out of my 31 years as a model, this has been the most phenomenal moment for diversity. And P. Diddy continues and says, we were born kings and queens. These images should have shown, should have been shown a long time ago. And I completely agree. They are they are phenomenal, but RuPaul as the Red Queen is just iconic. I felt like getting on my hands and knees and being like, oh, hey, RuPaul, you cannot, you just cannot touch them. Like, RuPaul is phenomenal. So this is my all-time favourite in the series, and I would definitely, definitely say go check out my Instagram stories or just Google Tim Walker Pirelli Calendar 2018, and you're welcome. That's all I'm going to say. You're welcome. So after the Tim Walker, there was my my third and final favourite standout piece was a dress by our, an incredible designer from the Netherlands called Iris van Harpen. And it was this kinetic dress. So it's made of white feathers and it has 
kinetic elements that attach to it that are also feathers that sort of come out and engulf the figure, but they, they move and they've worked together with an American sculptor called Anthony Howell to create this unbelievably beautiful circular kinetic sculpture that the dress sits within. And this was actually shown on, on the runway show, on her runway show in 2019. And Iris Van Harpen, she works collectively with designers and engineers and artists and scientists to create all these incredibly dynamic sculptures and dresses. Well, her, they're dresses, she creates dresses, but they're very sculptural, very beautiful. If anyone listening follows the Met Gala, Grimes wore one of her dresses this year and I think Winnie Harlow also wore one of her dresses this year. She's just... Give her a Google, they are just the most phenomenal creations ever. And I'm going to leave a link, there's a little behind the scenes video which shows the curatorial team and the conservation team at the v &A sort of building this, this fear. But what's, what I found really impactful, hold on, I'm going to play you a little bit of the video. Alice Curiouser and Curiouser is an exhibition that explores the impact and legacy of the Alice books across time and media. So we see how the story, its ideas, its concepts have inspired the most creative minds across the last 150 years. This is the Infinity Dress. It's been designed by fashion designer and artist Iris van Herpen, working alongside collaborator Anthony Howe, the sculptor, to create this omniverse kinetic sculpture that surrounds the dress. Iris van Herpen works collaboratively with artists, designers and engineers. So it's a work of the creative and the scientific imagination. Our work here at the V&A also reflects that collaborative nature of the piece. So we have worked with our textile conservators, metalwork sculpture conservators, to present this beautiful piece in the exhibition. We're very excited to include the infinity dress in the exhibition because it explores big ideas that we find in the book to do with space, time and scale and it encourages us to think about the world differently. It's like a work that's on the edge of reality. And I'm going to stop it there and I just thank the curator of the exhibition who was the woman that was speaking there. Her name is Kate Bailey. She has, she, I think she just completely summed up, because this is one of the last things you see before you leave the exhibition, and it's so overpowering and just a phenomenal bit of artistry. It's in fashion just kind of coming together. And it works really well because on the wall next to it is a quote. And the quote, it's from the book, because throughout the whole exhibition they have quotes and sort of tags from the book and it says she had grown so large in the last few minutes that she wasn't a bit afraid of interrupting him and I just found it very very powerful this idea that being brave and, and, and growing and being big and perhaps using fashion in that way to sort of help you almost kind of peacock if you will gives you gives you confidence in a way that you perhaps wouldn't otherwise and that for me was one of the standout moments I think the Tim Walker is my is of course hands down took it but this for me was a real moment of oh and I can't really remember the last time I was at an exhibition where it kind of stopped me dead in my tracks and I thought oh my gosh that's so poignant, particularly with everything that's going on with Me Too. And I've been reading into a lot about women's confidence and diversity. And I just, I don't know, for a book that was written over 150 years ago, it has very, 
his themes that have inspired generation after generation. And I think the V&A have done a really brilliant job of doing that. I think if I was to mark the exhibition out of five, I would have to give it four out of five because I found some of the rooms a bit scarce and a little bit dull. And the last ex the last room that you go to is sort of like a mirror infinity room where they have all the all these different sort of lines from the book and sentences and you just can kind of get lost within this little world of, of Alice. And it was lovely, but I feel that there were parts of it I found quite boring. There are some diehard Alice in Wonderland fans out there that would fight me to the death over that statement. And I completely understand. And I know so many people that completely love this book. And people like um, Vivian Westwood, for example, she's quoted of saying that she continuously rereads Alice to find new meaning and seek inspiration for her clothing line collections. I just think it was a very, a very excellent exhibition. I'm still only giving it four out of five, but it was a phenomenal exhibition. And this Iris Van Harpen dress is just phenomenal, particularly set off with with the quote. So I have to applaud Kate Bailey, who was the lead curator on this. She it was phenomenal. There is a wealth of online activities and reading that you can do with this exhibition. So I'm going to leave links to the VA show in the notes. And if you visited the show, like I would love to hear from you, please get in touch. Let me know what you thought of it. Or, you know, I'm recording this in November 2021. So depending on when this comes out, this might come out sort of January, February 2022. So I'm not too sure if it's touring anywhere, but it does close at the v &A in December. But it was phenomenal. And you can buy it. There is an exhibition catalogue, which I'll link in the show notes below. It's a shame, actually. I think if one thing that I'm surprised at, I would have thought that people like the V&A and the British Museum, having everyone gone through COVID and seeing all the fantastic technological advancements, that they would perhaps give you an option to, to buy a virtual tour. Because I think that's a really great way of continuously regenerating income in these, in these spaces because an exhibition is a moment and then it's gone. But with the technology that we have now, if you record an exhibition, like for example, I never got to their Alexander McQueen exhibition, which happened, I think that was 2013, 2014 at the v &A. You just couldn't get tickets for love nor money. And I think had they recorded that and left it as an option where you could purchase a limited edition sort of entry and virtual walkthrough of the show. And that would be something that continued to, as you know, generations grew up in, and found the exhibition and and discovered it as a way of continuously generating money. So I don't know. We would love to know your thoughts on that as well. But I think it would be a really clever thing to do for people that physically can't get to London because it's really annoying that everything happens in London. I'm very lucky that I live here, but I also I didn't grow up here, as you can hear from my accent. But it's very, very annoying that everything happens here. There are plenty of people in the UK that are so deserving of seeing this show and just can't afford a train ticket or indeed the entry price. It was about £20 to get in, although I have a, a membership card. Gone off on a little bit of a tangent there. But it was a fantastic exhibition and I would thoroughly encourage you to go and have a little read and more importantly, have a look at the Tim Walker Alice in Wonderland Pirelli calendar for 2018. It's going to blow your mind. And that's another episode of the Joe's Art History podcast. As always, all images that were discussed in today's podcast can be found on my highlights reel on my Instagram page, which is at Joe's Art History. If you just go on and find the corresponding number to this episode, then and click on that and you'll see all the images that I was talking about. Or feel free just to give it a little Google as and when you want. If you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you like, rate and subscribe. And please do tell your friends and family about the podcast. Shameless plug, but it would be lovely to get more and more people listening to the podcast. This is the first episode that I've reviewed an exhibition and given you my honest opinions of. If you've enjoyed it, let me know. Or if you didn't enjoy it, also let me know. And then I won't do any more. But I just thought I would try something a little bit different. If you want to get in touch, you can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram at joesarthistory. Once again, thank you so, so much for listening. 
and my name is Joe McLaughlin, your host and resident art historian on the Joe's Art History Podcast. Until next time, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.